distinguished lecture that Professor Sheldon Pollock will deliver shortly. Um, since a number of you, uh, as far as I can see, are coming to our event for the first time, I'd like to say a little bit about what these global centers are and what are we doing and what is the idea behind a university trying to go global. Uh, and then uh, we had uh, Mrs. Birla uh, who wanted to introduce and attend uh, Professor Pollock's talk, unfortunately, is not well. Uh, so, Dr. Rangaraj from the Aditya Birla group would formally introduce uh, Shelley to all of you. But let me say a few words about the Global Centers and our previous speakers in this series. Um, and then Shelley will obviously talk and we will have hopefully a good round of Q&A subsequent to his lecture. So, Global Centers uh, at Columbia essentially um, are about five years old. Uh, the first two centers were launched in uh, Beijing uh, and Amman. And subsequently, six more have been launched. We are one of them. So there are eight centers around the world. And there are two uh, pretty unique characteristics of these centers as I see them. One, uh, they are university-wide. So we are not run or owned by a particular school. Uh, we cut across the university in terms of the disciplines that are taught, the, the different areas of research that faculty undertake in. So you could potentially have a project on architecture along with something on uh, public health, uh, along with something on international affairs from the School of International and Public Affairs. So, so the idea is that you are cutting across disciplines and trying to undertake research, uh, which the faculty do, uh, and we are supposed to uh, facilitate uh, that cut across disciplines. Number two is the idea that we are a network. So we are not just one or two centers, but we are eight centers. And what the university is trying to do in the process is to see if we can undertake research across centers, uh, which would mean essentially how uh, research could be seen across sites, across disciplines, and learnings from those uh, research activities and, and uh, outreach and programming that we do then reach through us to the campus and we can get knowledge and information flows from the campus to the center. So it is essentially a two-way uh, knowledge and information flows idea uh, when it comes to these centers. They're also governed by two uh, institutional mechanisms. One is called what is called the Faculty Steering Committee. Uh, and I'm happy to say that Shelley is the chair of the South Asia uh, centers faculty steering committee and we are guided under his leadership about the different areas that we should be looking at, what kind of programs should we be looking at, whether it's public programming, conferences, workshops, thematic areas, which schools should we be engaging in and so on. And secondly, uh, we have an advisory board, uh, which essentially consists of uh, people from uh, the corporate world, the academics, uh, some uh, well-known personalities um, who are in the public domain, and alumni. Uh, so the idea is that with these two uh, instruments, so-called instruments for the global centers, they could be guided from the faculty side as well as the advisory board. So that's in very short uh, what the global centers are. We are just about three and a half years old. Uh, we were launched in uh, March of 2010. Uh, and began operations in September of 2010. So we're just about three and a half years old. Uh, we're trying to uh, diversify in terms of what we do. And one of the activities that we do is to try and bring uh, Columbia faculty uh, to the center to have exactly events like these to uh, showcase some of the expertise that Columbia has as far as this region is concerned. And Shelley surely is right up there in terms of uh, uh, the expertise uh, in the substantive sense of the term and surely even the geographical sense of the term and you'll hear uh, from him shortly. So let me now turn it over to Dr. Uh, Rangaraj who will formally introduce Shelley to us. Thank you. The Aditya Birla Group. May I extend a very warm welcome to Professor Sheldon Pollock, his family, and distinguished guests in the gathering who have come today. I'm going to read out the speech. It gives me great pleasure to be part of this gathering this evening to listen to a renowned scholar, 
Professor Sheldon Pollock from the Columbia University. As many of you know, the Aditya Birla Group's association with the Columbia University goes back to 2003 when we first met with Dr. Nirupam Bajpai, who at that time was associated with the Earth Institute at Columbia University based in New York. Over the years, we have developed a strong relationship with the university in general and the Earth Institute in particular. Our group admires what the Earth Institute has been doing all over the developing world and India in particular in the field of sustainable development. As a business house which is committed to sustainable development, we too in our own modest way work for the development in about 3000 villages in the areas of health, education, sustainability, women empowerment, water resource management and agriculture. And the person who supervises this and does this is also present here today, Pragya Ram, an outstanding professional in the area of corporate communications and CSR. I'm happy to say that under Dr. Bajpai's leadership and the young and dynamic team of staff that he has, he has put together the Columbia Global Center, which is indeed, it has achieved a great deal in such a short period, and I hope it will continue to make substantial contributions in the sectors they are engaged in. This will not only result in greater partnerships between the faculty and the students from Columbia University and Indian academic institutions, NGOs and corporates, but will also add to the state and national level policy dialogues, some, something that Dr. Vajpai has been engaged for the last several years. Our speaker tonight, Professor Sheldon Pollock, is currently Arvind Raghunathan Professor of Sanskrit and South Asian Studies at Columbia University. He was previously the George Babrinsky Distinguished Service Professor of Sanskrit and India Studies at the University of Chicago, where he taught from 1989 to 2005. He has been a visiting professor at Harvard University, Oxford University, Indian Institute of Advanced Study, the University of Calicut, and has lectured around the world. He is a past director of the International Collaborative Research Project, Sanskrit Knowledge Systems on the Eve of Colonialism, and is currently co-director of the Columbia Princeton Comparative Project on China and India, and the Columbia Heidelberg Bilateral Digital Humanities Program. Professor Pollock is the author and editor of numerous books, including The Language of Gods in the World of Men, Sanskrit Culture and Power in the Pre-Modern India, for which he won the Kumaraswamy Trialing and other awards. The Ends of Man, that's another publication, at the end of pre-modernity, pre literary cultures in history, reconstructions from South Asia, forms of knowledge in early modern Asia, world philology, and four volumes of translation of Sanskrit poetry. See the achievement of the scholar. He is a founding editor of the Murthy Classical Library of India, published by the Harvard University Press, historical source book in classical Indian thought, published by Columbia University Press, and South Asia Across the Disciplines, published by University of California, University of Chicago, and Columbia University Presses. And he served as co-editor and editor of the Clay Sanskrit Library, published by New York University Press. Professor Pollock's honors include the Distinguished Achievement Award from the Andrew Mellon Foundation and the Presidential Certificate of Honor for Sanskrit and Padma Shri, both from the Government of India. We invite Professor Pollock to deliver his lecture. Welcome, sir. Tyanta anugurthosmi yat bhavatam anena amantranena asmin mahanagare samskrita vishaye pravachanam dhatum bharatiya jnani na kim prayojanam iti prashne kintu New York nagare kopi samskritam na bhashate Ateva abhyasa abhavat nirargalam samskritam bhashitam na shakyate maya. Abhi cha 
अस्मिन् महानगरे मुंबई नगरे वीरलानाम एव संस्कृत भाषण अवगमन शक्ति मत्वम वर्तते अतः अंग्रेजी भाषा माश्रिता वचनम् प्रवचनम् ददामि इति जम so I, I'm, I, what I just said is uh, thank you so much to the Birla Group for this fabulous opportunity to speak with you tonight. I've decided to speak in English rather than Sanskrit, and I hope that will make things a little bit more intelligible. I sometimes, as I was thinking about this talk, I wish I had named it uh, The Beauty of Nature in Kalidasa's Poetry something very simple and easy to talk about. Instead, as is my nature, I've decided to take on, in some ways, the most challenging topic of the day for people like me. What is the purpose of Indian knowledge? Now, Indian knowledge is a complicated phrase, Indian knowledge. You could take it in two ways. Knowledge about India and the people of India in a sort of objective sense, or you could take it in a subjective sense, the knowledge that people in India have produced. Knowledge about Indians or knowledge of Indians. I want to explore this double dimension, first of all, briefly in the two areas where it's most pertinent to me, in the US and in India. The short answer to my question, to let the cat out of the bag right at the start, is that knowledge by Indians, traditional knowledge in both the United States and in India, and in my view, for the first time in perhaps 3,000 years, the value is zero, close to zero. And I want to explain why that is the case and explain why that is false and needs to be changed. Knowledge about India and Indians. Nobody who runs a university in the United States today has the least doubt that knowledge about India, about public health in India, about eliminating smallpox or polio, about industrial pollution, about political processes, knowledge about those things is important. Nobody has any doubt that we need to understand Indian political realities in, in a world of security concerns and scarcity. Nobody has any doubt in the United States that we need to understand levels of air pollution in the city of Delhi. Nobody has any doubt that we need to understand how to vaccinate the entire population of West Bengal in order to eliminate smallpox and understand something about attitudes towards the body, attitudes towards, attitudes towards the community, and so on, in order to achieve that. Knowledge about South Asia, in that sense, is matter of critical importance to the people of the United States. And money and energy and faculty resources are directed to those purposes. In some ways, the Earth Institute and Columbia's, Columbia's uh, center is partly dedicated to understanding things about South Asia in order to improve the world. That's great. No one is contesting the importance of that. And this is part of a very substantial shift in American education toward what people have called problem-focused inquiry or applied knowledge. We want to know things in order to change the world in some palpable way, and in order to intervene in climate change or in public health issues. In this case, 
knowledge is basically just information. What people in India have thought over the centuries is of no consequence to this mode of thinking. And in fact, it's become far less obvious what that form of thinking means in the American university. Let me be very personal about this and chart for you something about the shift in America before I get to India, about this second form of knowledge. I'll do this very quickly, but institutions and institutional locations for the making of knowledge is really critical. When India became part of the understanding of the American university, it was Sanskrit that was India. The universities I've been associated with, Harvard, University of Chicago, and Columbia, all started the investigation of Indian knowledge in the second sense, what knowledge Indian people have produced over the centuries. That was the centerpiece. Sanskrit was the beginning of Indian studies in the United States at Harvard in 1840, at Columbia in 1880, at the University of Chicago in 1890. It all started with Sanskrit. And the knowledge embedded in Sanskrit and Persian and Arabic, all languages of India, that contain Indian knowledge. After the Second World War, after the Second World War, people who were interested in Indian knowledge, what Indian people have done and thought about the world, were located in other departments, in political science, in sociology and anthropology. Those people lived in these other disciplines. But something very important and transformative happened at the end of the 20th century, for good reasons in part. People known as decision makers realized that there were certain kinds of, that there were certain kinds of questions that were no longer pertinent to area knowledge. Climate change, global problems, could not be solved by area specialists, they thought. Area studies, in this sense, was destroyed. The disciplines, political science, economics, sociology, drove the people, the area studies people, out of those departments and relocated them to departments like mine. Sanskrit and Indian studies departments. The net result of that is that the commitment to the knowledge that Indians have made, knowledge in the second sense, the subjective knowledge, has been profoundly marginalized in the United States. Our capacity to teach languages, literatures, history of South Asia has been deeply compromised over the last 20 years. I would go so far as to say that in the United States today, it is completely unclear to administrators and presidents and deans and provosts what Indian knowledge, in the second sense, is worth. A very worrisome state of affairs. And I should tell you, having just concluded a two-day conference with Nirupam's support and guidance on the global humanities in Africa, the Arab world, South Asia, and East Asia. It is very unclear to most university administrators what traditional knowledge in any of those places is worth. So India, the United States is not peculiar, and the situation the situation in India is not peculiar either. Let me turn to that now. What does Indian knowledge mean? What is Indian knowledge good for in India? Let me tell you a story. I was, when I landed in Delhi six months ago, 
I've just overstayed my visa by two days. Big problem. When I landed in, in Delhi uh, six months ago, I was invited to give a lecture at a new university, I wanna, which I want to tell you about this new university in a moment. Very, very interesting place. Private university, well endowed, making important tenured appointments, thoughtful people, Indian School of Business, Hyderabad people who started this. They now have an MA program. 200 of the very best, smartest kids in India are part of this MA program, from the best colleges. Really smart, dynamic, energized, driven young people who really want to learn. And I, I, um, I had been in touch with the vice chancellor, and I knew their program well, program where Indian knowledge was not even on the map. This was a program there was no Indian courses taught at all. I asked the kids in the audience, how many of you, these are 22, 23, 24-year-olds, how many of you has ever taken a course in college on Indian literature or on Indian civilization, the sort of thing that every American kid must take, Western Civ, where you read Plato, you read Aristotle, you read St. Augustine, you read the Bible, you read Virgil, whatever. Not a single kid raised his or her hand. No student had ever taken a course in Indian literature, had never read Kalidasa, had never read Amir Khusro, had never read Keshav Das. I, I was absolutely astonished. So I began to think, you know, what is the, what good is Indian knowledge in India? Now, there are very big issues that Indian, the, the Indian nation is confronting in higher education. The numbers are truly astonishing. And there are lots of issues on the table. Uh, student, student professor ratios are off the charts. Uh, there's something like 40% um, deficiency in faculty, in the absolute availability of faculty. 40% of the, of the positions are empty. There's a long history to this story. Colonialism is part of it. Once upon a time, there were gurukuls and patashalas and madrasas where forms of knowledge that fit into this second category, I'm trying, were produced. Those have all disappeared. And where they continue to exist, in my opinion, and I don't know every corner of every every region in India, one has a sense that, that the remaining patashalas and madrasas are mindless institutions. But what about, what about the, the universities? Well, how were those set up? Remember, I mean, we're just about to celebrate or the 150th, my math is so bad, the 1857 universities, Madras and Bombay and Calcutta. Those were largely built on the Western model. And Indian knowledge of the sort, the second sort that I'm talking about, was of no interest to those institutions. Let's fast forward to post-1947. Where did India put its money? It's put its money in a smart place. This happened in many other parts of the world. When India wants to produce excellence, it can do so. And there is plenty of evidence in the IITs, the IIMs, the, II, uh, the IISs. When India wants to produce serious, world-class, professional expertise, it can achieve it. It did not put money into the Institute, the Indian Institute of the Humanities. There is no such thing. There is no major commitment on the part of the Indian government to Indian knowledge in this second sense. Maybe in the Q&A we can talk about a counterexample, namely China, where there are massive resources being committed to Chinese knowledge of the sort that I've been describing. Indian studies in India, Indian studies in India, never was developed. There is no such program of Indian studies in India. 
There's Chinese studies in China. There were American studies in India. The Hyderabad, the, every, you, some of you may know, the great Hyderabad Center, which has since closed. American studies, there were models, but Indian studies in India never became an academic value. Things have started to change a little bit, I think. I mentioned Ashoka University. When I had, this is not Atma Prashasti or anything, when I had breakfast with the vice chancellor and I pointed out to him this rather odd thing that a new college, a liberal arts college, was being developed in Haryana on the model of an American liberal arts college and there was not a single course on India, he said, hmm, you're right, let's do it. So they are now, I'm happy to say, it's not because of me, it was just, you know, they are now moving towards developing a track in Indian Civ. Some of the other new universities coming up, Sark University, nothing of the sort, completely off the charts there. It's not even clear that the new Nalanda University is going to have a I mean, I, they asked me to design a philology program, which that's the word I use for the language and literature studies that gets to Indian knowledge in the second sense. As far as I know, there isn't going to be a philology department. There's going to be a tourism department. That's okay. Let me, let me, let me talk about one experiment that is interesting. Some of you will know about the reforms at Delhi University. It was all over the papers about six or eight months ago. The vice chancellor of DU decided to transform the three-year BA into a four-year BA. Unfortunately, he only left six weeks for that to happen. 30,000 students, 10,000 faculty trying to run together to produce new syllabi. That was not such a good thing. And so Allison and I have very close friends at DU and everyone was going crazy trying to figure out how to how to, how to develop new syllabi in six weeks that would, that would mark the life careers of students. Forget about that. Here's one of the things they did try to do, and I want to applaud them for this. They introduced a new kind of liberal arts program, including tracks in Sanskrit, tracks in Gujarati, tracts in Hindi, tracts in Persian. Those are not the only places where Indian knowledge, in this sense that I've been referring to using that term, is produced or preserved. But those are key sites. If you want to figure out what people in India have thought over time, you need to know some of those languages. And DU seems to be interested in teaching them at some level. But if you look at the four-year BA materials, why, why are they introducing a track in Sanskrit? What are they going to do with that? What is the good? Bharati Ignanena Kim Prayojanam. What is the prayojana of having this knowledge? This is what they say. The Sanskrit track at DU, the four-year uh, four program, seeks to promote awareness about significant issues of social and national concern as gleaned through Sanskrit sources. Units include human resource development through physical and mental health. A human resource development model for Sanskrit studies. It's easy, it's easy to, and I, when I first read this, I, I guffawed as well. People, but let's, let, let's be fair. People are searching for a way to make sense of the past and they need better questions. They need better questions. This, these are not stupid people who are, who are, being, who, who are writing in bad faith. They know that there is a proyogenum. They are just, they're just having trouble enunciating it. And it's not a simple thing to enunciate. I was telling the story the other day. 
uh, I forget where I've been talking all over the place. At some place. I, I was called, uh, several people, Harvard University was preparing a new report on the humanities. The humanities is another word for describing knowledge in this second sense. And four of us were invited to Harvard University by the president, Professor Drew Faust, to speak about the humanities. And I thought, whoa, this is pretty interesting. I wonder why the president is inviting us to, to talk about the humanities. And I asked her why she was doing this. She said, well, donors want to understand what the humanities are for. And I'm not sure. <laughs> I need good reasons. So let's, la let's not laugh at the DU faculty who, two minutes before midnight, were trying to figure out what substance to put into this empty vessel. Because other people in other places who've thought longer and harder have problems too. At some level, at some level we know that these issues are central to our lives as human beings. I want to turn to some of these issues right now. Uh, let me start by saying this, that, and I want to repeat this. India, the United States, China, this is a global, this is a global problem, as I saw yesterday, discussing this with very, very sharp people from around the world. The problem of what the past means to the present, to put it most simply, is a problem everyone is facing. There are massive enrollments in these courses around the world of students who have nothing else to do. They're shut out of medicine, they're shut out of engineering, they're shut out of every other life chance. Sanskrit, Persian, Old Hindi, Old Gujarati, Old Kannada in India are the bottom of the food chain. People go there because they can't go anywhere else. And this is true in the Arab world. This is true, this is true in, uh, it's true in many places, in fact. India, nobody is blaming India. India is part of a global, I hate to use the word, but I will use it, a global crisis in thinking through these problems of knowledge. And I don't, I'm not saying that I, uh, this is just one small person who spent part of his life working on these issues and trying to think through what is it that has driven me so this is not a theory I'm going to give you. And some of it I'm not 100% sure I fully believe in. That's sort of an autobiography of what these, what Indian knowledge has meant to me, okay? So let me give you a few possible answers to that question. Bharati Jnana Kim Pryojanam. The first answer I think you will find very odd and unfamiliar. Indian knowledge in the second sense, like Greek knowledge, like Hebrew knowledge, like, is important because it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. You cannot put a price on it. Kids today know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Most people do. Market thinking, read Michael Sandel's book, What Money Can't Buy. Market thinking has invaded everything. What does the study of ancient India help you understand? That there are things you cannot buy. There are things that you cannot turn into a profit. There are things you do not instrumentalize. We do not study ancient Indian past to find the cure for cancer in a Vedic text. There is no cure for cancer in the Veda. There's no recipe for cold fusion in the Veda. 
Knowing something about the past is radically non-instrumental, if I can put it that way. We do not solve problems. We make problems. We, people who study such things, raise ontological questions, questions about your existence as a human being. Let me read you very briefly. I have to keep my eye on the time because Nirupam didn't want me to go on, and I have a tendency to go on. So pull the, pull the chain. <laughs> pull me off the stage. I want to read you something. You may, people may know Tom Stoppard, the English playwright. Well, he, Stoppard wrote a play about, a, about an English professor. And this is... My first, this first point about what good is Indian knowledge, and I say it's good for nothing. This is how he explains this. Listen, this is a beautiful passage. This kind of scholarship I'm talking about is, and here's where the quote begins, is where we're nearest to our humanness. Useless knowledge for its own sake. Useful knowledge, useful knowledge is good. It's good too but it's for the faint-hearted. It's an elaboration of the real thing. The real thing, which is only to shine some light. It doesn't matter where or on what. Shine some light. It's the light itself against the darkness. It's what's left of God's purpose when you take God away. You know, one more word about Harvard. They just published a report on the humanities. And they end the report by saying, you know, our students, we're not sure, maybe we should join the social sciences. Our students, they say, express the desire to contribute positively to society. Well, we all want to contribute positively to society. One way to contribute is to think hard about humanness and how knowledge works. You know, here's another way to put the matter. Um, in 1854, this is not my favorite historian, Otto von Ranke, Leopold von Ranke. Ranke is a very famous German historian who said history is the way things really are. But in 1854, he gave a lecture to the king of Bavaria, a private lecture. Those days, kings, you know. Those are the days like Bhojaraj, whom I'll come back to in a moment. Bhojaraj could just summon to his sabha anybody. So King, Leop King, King of Bavaria could do this. And he gave a, quite a fascinating lecture in 1854 about his fundamental beliefs in, his, in history. And he said he strongly opposes, he strongly opposes the view that every generation may be thought of only as a stepping stone to the next generation that they're important only for what they contribute to the next generation. And the next generation is always supposed to be the superior generation. For Ranka, and this is the passage I've always treasured, every generation is immediate to God. Unmittelbar zu Gott. What does that mean? It means that every generation has value in its very existence. The very existence of a human being is a ultimate value. And for me, the existence of a human being's consciousness is of an ultimate value. If you take that seriously, you're then taken to my next point about why this stuff is important. It has to do with diversity. When kids grow up today, they have a single model of the world. I mean, uh, when I grew up, we had a single model of the world. It's the nature of unreflective life. The world is the way it is. The arrangements of our time are the arrangements of our time. That is how it is. That's human nature. 
Well, I'll tell you something. If you spend a little time reading in the extraordinary archive of ancient India, you will find that human nature is not human nature, that the arrangements are not the arrangements, that there are very radically different ways of being human. Radically different ways of being human. I don't think I'm being romantic, this with a capital R, romantic or Pollyannish at all in saying this. I mean, this book I wrote that uh, was referred to earlier, The Language of the Gods, is a study in the diversity of human life. It's a study that shows, you know, when we think about regional languages in South Asia, for example, it had nothing to do with a single people, single blood, single soil. It's not even clear there were ideas of ethnicity in the early days. When you, when you moved into a place called Kannada or Karnataka, you were moving into the land of black soil, and you spoke the language of the land of the black soil. When you moved into France, you spoke the language of the Franks. Or in England, the language of the Angles. There, now, I don't want to demonize Europe, but there is a very different model of language and peoplehood in South Asia that people have never seen before. Because, oh, this is how it always is. Well, it's not how it always is. And you can never get beyond how it always is unless you take Indian knowledge seriously. One of the things you discover when you discover Indian knowledge is the question of radical diversity. That the world has not always been the same, has not always been the same. You know, when I talk about Indian knowledge, we could just as well be talking about classical knowledge or, as I say, Hebrew knowledge or Arabic knowledge or Chinese knowledge. And classicists, the people who study Greek and Latin, have thought about these issues, and there are two of them, very celebrated people, have talked about what is classical knowledge good for? What is the priogenum of Greek and Latin? Why bother with that? This is what they said. Every educated person in the West knows that it is only against the backdrop of their cultural past that can provide a frame within which they can situate and recognize themselves. And this lies pretty much at the root of everything we can say or think or do. Self-knowledge. How do you know who you are if you don't know who you, where you came from? Memory, cultural memory. Let me talk about that for a second. Why is Alzheimer's in the individual a bad thing? Sometimes it seems pretty good to me, actually. But most people think Alzheimer's in the individual is a tragedy. Your past is erased. Why is Alzheimer's in the nation, let me not use the word nation, in the social formation at large, why is that not a bad thing? People have talked about the ethics of forgetting. The problem with the ethics of forgetting you know, I mean, I've even written about that. I always, you know, in 1992 when all the troubles were happening in India, I, be, I wrote something and I said, you know, the problem is those, those it's not the, the problem is not those who forget the past who are condemned to repeat it. The problem is those who remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Memory is a very complicated issue, but I submit to you that m loss of memory at the level of the social, for, at the society at large is just as bad, just as tragic as memory at the loss of an individual. Smriti bhangshat buddhi nashaha. 
Now, memory, as I said, is a highly contested thing. India's struggles today are about contested memories. You remember one thing, I remember that thing just quite differently. Let me turn to this issue. And in fact, I'll spend just five or seven minutes talking about it. It's a complicated issue, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. It's about this question of memory and how to think through the problems of memory. And for me, it kind of gets to the core of kind of gets to the core of what Indian knowledge, why it matters to us. Let me, let me start by just talking about the Ramayana, Valmiki Ramayana. Take that as an example, okay? Because whenever there's an issue in India, <laughs> it seems to be around the Ramayana. You know, it's a text we, we, we love and cannot live with sometimes. Now I've written, and I still believe, I still believe this, in my seriously scholarly mode, I think I can show you, on the basis of inscriptions and manuscripts and a whole bunch of things, that the Ramayana was composed in the post-Ashokan era, around the second century BCE, before the Common Era. It may happen in the Treta Yuga, but it was not composed in the Treta Yuga, whenever the Treta Yuga was. The Ramayana is probably a second century BC text, first an oral text. It was slowly committed to writing over the next 100 and 200 years, and then slowly synthesized. It knows Ashokan inscriptions. According to Sheldon Pollock in some obscure journal, uh, that is one way to think about that text. That's one, let's call it my historical memory of that text. Are you with me so far? It's very important that I'm as clear as I can possibly. I really want to, and I'm just thinking about this. I've just, in fact, I'm just writing about this now, and I'm not sure I fully, I fully grasp my own arguments here, so I want to try to be as clear as possible. There is a kind of scholarly memory that I just described to you about the Valmiki Ramayana. But it's complicated by something, the tradition. So I'm very interested in the South Indian tradition of commentary on the Ramayana. It begins in the 11th, 12th century, mostly in the Tamil Nadu area, in Sanskrit, but then eventually in Tamil as well. The people who wrote on the Ramayana in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century in South India have a very different vision. They say the Ramayana was not uh, a fiction. It was not a, the Ramayana is not a fiction. The Ramayana is the story of God's deeds on earth. Everything that happens in the Ramayana is absolutely true. Say the commentaries on these texts from the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century. What do I do with such pronouncements? Well, what most Orientalists did, what most scholars did in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and somebody even reviewed one of my books and said, this is idiocy, taking this stuff seriously. So that person wanted to say, oh, all of those readers in the 12th, 13th, 14th century are stupid. They're stupid ignorant, and they should be thrown into the trash can of history. They do not know what they're talking about. They're ideologues, they're the theologians, they have no claim to any sort of truth. Now I came to realize over my life that this was not a very useful way of understanding human life. I began to understand that texts have no single meaning, that texts have multiple meanings for multiple communities. The deeper you understand Indian knowledge, the deeper you understand this primary, shall I say it, truth, that there is no single truth, 
That's the big truth, that there are multiple truths. Now, when somebody in 2014 attacks a person who says, this is a post-to-show conviction, and if you, if you say this is a fiction, you are wounding the sentiments of my community, what do we do then? So you see, we have a third, a kind of third level of meaning, don't we? We have my historian's meaning, where I'm dead sure that this is a post-Ashokan fiction, meant to, to rethink the nature of political power in a post-Buddhist world. The South Indian commentators are sure this is a record of God's vision, God's, God's deeds on earth. The contemporary person wants to say, this text speaks to me in a central way, and you are not allowed to deny that. What do we do with that person? What do we do? What do we do the fa in the face of these conflicts? Some people say, let's sue them. Some people say, let's shout them down. Other people say, let's shoot them. Suing, shouting, and shooting is not the answer. What is the answer? The deeper you learn to read, the deeper you learn to read, the more space you can provide for these three different types of understandings. This is the value of Indian knowledge. It teaches you the diversity of understanding. If you've never struggled with an Indian text, a Sanskrit text, a Persian text, an old Hindi text, or let me put it more positively, if you've been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to struggle with those kinds of texts, you'll have understood the struggle over meaning and how these multiple possibilities are always present. Now let me say this. I'm going to stop here because the time is running out. What I just described to you is not Sheldon Pollock's theory of the world. I think there is a very deep traditional authentication, a traditional value that we can recover here. When I was a boy, I was told, I, I'm, I come from the Jewish tradition. When I was a boy, somebody told me of an old rabbi, a story about an old rabbi. And one disputant came to him, and the rabbi said, you're right. And then another disputant came to him, and the rabbi said, you're right. And then the third person came and said, you can't tell them they're both right. And the rabbi said, you're right. <laughs> That's the Jewish tradition. My dear friend Musafar Alam, uh, great historian of Mughal India, told me a story about uh, Rumi. Rumi was once abused by the follower of a particular school for saying that he was one, he agreed, with all 73 sects of Islam. The man abused him for that, and Rumi smiled in, at him and he said, I'm in agreement with whatever you say. And there's one more traditional form of this knowledge that I want to close with. My, one of my favorite people in India, old India, Bhojaraj, from a little place in Madhya Pradesh, Dhara. I spent a lot of time with Bhojaraj, reading his fabulous Shringara Prakasha, Saraswati Kantabharana, a man of extraordinary literary sensitivity. And somewhere, I forget exactly where, in one of these Prabhanda books, he has this verse. It's a verse that encapsulates exactly what I'm talking about. The world of the 12th, of 11th century uh, India was a world of highly contested views. Buddhists, Jains, Vaidika people, Shaiva people, not just 
intellectual struggle, but sometimes this developed into real violence. The Piriya Puranam tells stories of the beheading of 72 Jaina monks in Tamil Nadu by um, uh, one of the Chola kings. I mean, I don't think that was really true. But we know for a fact that there were cases where where Shaivas appropriated Jaina temples, where Jainas had, a temple Buddha, had, had, had appropriated Buddhist temples. There was real on-the-ground struggle. And this is what Boja said. Shrautavya, Shrautavya Saugato Dharmaha. You should study Buddhism. Shrautavya Saugato Dharmaha. Kartavyas Punar Arhataha. You should enact China Dharma. Vaidiko Vyavahartavyaha. Deport yourself like a, like a Vedic person. Dhyatavyah Paramah Shivaha. And meditate on Shiva as the Supreme Being. That encapsulates for me what Indian knowledge is good for. Thank you so much. Catullus, the Latin poet. Another favorite poet is Jules Laforgue, French poet. These are all poets of my culture. I don't think there are any boundaries around culture. Who gets to speak for India? I think we all get to speak for India. But here's the thing, it, it, here's the key thing. We shouldn't just speak, we have to listen. What I think the problem, I think, I think the problem has been among some of my colleagues in the distant past up to the present, is their failure to listen, failure to realize that there is more than one point of view, failure to understand that there are some people who bear historical wounds from colonialism or elsewhere who may have a very different point of view about what you're saying, whose worries and concerns and marma, whose soft spots, you must anticipate. It's not only a question of who gets to speak for India, but it's a question of listening as well. I hope that somewhere is an answer. So I have uh, actually three points. Please. Anugrahi Tosmi. So in, re in uh, response to the verse that you quoted at the end, yes. I would like to also quote another couple of verses Please. from your favorite poet, Bhartrahari. Ah. Uh, the verses are, Bhinnam darshanam ashritya vyavaharo nu gamyate tatrayan mukhyam ekesham tatran nyesham viparyayaha which also encapsulates in a philosophical way what you have stated. Very nice. Right? And the other verse that I want to quote from Bhartruhari is along the similar lines, which runs like this. It says, Pradnya vivekam labhate bhinnai ragama sangrahaihi kiyadva shakyamunnetum svatarkam anudhavata, mm. which also uh, highlights the point that you stated as to what exactly is the significance or the importance or the prayojana of the Indian knowledge. And one of the key uh, prayojanas stated in this verse is Pradnya Vivekam Labhate. Correct. Right? So in this connection, the second point that I want to put forward is, um, as you rightly pointed out, the root-orientedness, right? Rather than the fruit-orientedness mm. and the relevance mania that has been um, right. running around. Right, good phrase. Um, so I think these Bhartruhari verses also point out to this root-orientedness, uh, which uh, Indian institutions and some other institutions in the world uh, should follow. In this connection, I would like to request some help from you. Sir. Um, to help a colleague, a friend of mine in Chicago, who wants to um, spread, who wants to study um, same question, what Indian knowledge is good for? Ah. And he wants to organize the sixth Sanskrit Computational Linguistics Symposium. 
right? And I request you to help. Okay, me. we'll talk about that afterwards. <laughs> no more, no more grant applications. Huh? <laughs> and lastly, and lastly, about uh, a comment about the IITs that you mentioned. Yes. Um, I come from IIT Bombay. Uh, uh, department. Oh, did we, were we in touch with each other at some point? Yes, uh, I asked you to come to yes, Bombay. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm so sorry, I couldn't accept your invitation. Sorry, uh, we missed you, uh. Uh, but next time, please. And so I belong to the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. Yes. And I must point out to you that uh, since last 10 years, IIT Bombay has uh, uh, taken initiative uh. and has formulated uh, something called a cell for Indian science and technology in Sanskrit. And we are focused in, uh, focusing on two major areas. Um, one of them is astronomy, and the other one is uh, grammar, on Indian grammar. And there have been uh, contributions made by some scholars in terms of uh, various um, material that has been produced in various types of media, right. for example, a book published from Springer on astronomy, Kerala School of Astronomy. Yes, 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 I know that. And then NPTEL lectures and so on. Terrific. And also, um, let's, 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 let's let somebody else talk, but this is very helpful. I appreciate that. And also, for example. Yeah, let's move on. Sir. And uh, there were several classicists there and, uh, and me. And the vision of the world in classical, let's call it classical antiquity, is radically different from the vision of the world in Indian antiquity. For example, just, just take, just take the, 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 the history of Sanskrit language, its movement about, around the world and how it interacted with local language, something of great interest to me. Just, just follow this for one second. Wherever Sanskrit traveled, it helped to develop regional languages, desha this is a This is a historical fact. Wherever Latin went, it helped to destroy regional languages. Wherever Sanskrit went, new Alphabets were developed for Sanskrit. Grantha, Kannada Lipi, Tarugulipi, Devanagari, Sharada. Wherever Latin went, there was one and one only alphabet, the Roman alphabet. So in the one case, you have a world of uniformity. In the other case, you have a celebration of diversity. So not all... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not saying we should destroy classical antiquity and never study it, but there are other values there. There are other values that contrast with the values in our world, in the world of India. And that, so it's not all the same. There are multiple values that we meet, need to balance. I hope that's helpful too. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you my, well, read the language of the gods. It's still available. It's only 500 rupees. <laughs> Uh, Professor Pollock, just Professor Pollock, can I ask you a question? Oh. Uh, in fact, two. One is, you talked about <clears throat> one city civilization or one culture being a stepping stone to the other. Now, this was Ranke. This was not Pollock. Okay, fine. Right. You you just quoted Ranke. Right. Now the reverse of that. If you remember the famous Abhinav Bharati quote. Mm. Yes. Parikalpitanam Viveka Sopana Paramparana. Yes, it's Abhinava Bharati. Abhinava Bharati. Yes, exactly. I know that verse. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the thinking was that whatever the previous persons have done, 
we are stepping on that and trying to improve upon that. Correct. Yes. Agreed, agreed, agreed. But this is a slightly different, I mean, I mean, the idea is an important one. Abhinava says, is it a very fabulous, I wish I could give you a lecture on Abhinava Bharati, but I just did that, didn't I? <laughs> I, I, spent I, I have a new, I, I have to just tell you one thing. I don't know how much time we have, but I must tell you this. I must tell you this. Here's one of the greatest books in world aesthetics. One of the greatest books in world aesthetics is called but we're not sure what Abhinava Bharati means. It's a multiple pun. This book exists in one manuscript. One fragile manuscript in Trivandrum, Kerala. It's not in Kashmir. One fragile manuscript. It has not been looked at in a hundred years. It has never been digitized. It's never been archivally preserved. One of the great, so you see, if people start taking Indian knowledge seriously, they will not let the treasures of India simply rot on the shelf of a library. But anyway, so I, I should say that thanks to the, the, the new director of the uh, Karyavottam uh, Government Manuscripts Library in Kerala and uh, my indefatigable friend Shaji PL, we are going to have a digital archive of the Abhinava Bharati, and we're going to put this online for the whole world to see. Good. Thank you. <laughs> but this is a wonderful, no, Abhinava, it's true. Abhinava is not saying these people are less important than we were. He's Ooh. simply saying we could never get where we are if we did not have the sopana of our previous acharyas. Viveka sopana parampara. There you go. Okay. Very then, nice quote. The, ne the next one. The next one is, just like we were raising issues of what is Indian knowledge good for, is there any equivalent of American traditional knowledge? <laughs> no, no, I'm asking you seriously because American, what we call the Native Americans, had a lot of... Yes, nice yes, it's true. I'm not qualified is to speak about that. Is there any effort that. made to find out something about that I'm in not, the United States? I'm not really qualified to speak to that question. It's an important one. Uh, but, you know, America's a young country. The colonial, the settler colonial part of America is a young country. But there is a, you know, I think about the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. I mean, in a way, that is now an archaic document. That presents, if I may compare small things with great, that, that constitutes a very comparable, a, a very close analogy to the Ramayana. In what sense? People are always struggling over the meaning of the Constitution. <laughs> You have your literalists, your original, well, you know this, of course. But you see, th this, this is a key, the, the kind of interpretation theory that I'm suggesting has, I think, modestly, ramifications in the world of jurisprudence, where the Second Amendment, yeah, it means we can all have guns, but we want to have guns in churches and schools? I mean, there has to be some sort of sense of the usefulness. Let me put it the way Rorty, Richard Rorty put it. We must, we must replace knowledge with social hope. We must replace knowledge with consensus. We must find ways not to be right, but to live together. Uh, Professor Pollock, just a uh Interesting. This, uh, this will be the last question, it's 8.30. Thank you. Uh, as a Columbia alumni and an oh, advisory board member, I appreciate that. Uh, I just wanted to point out a cultural phenomenon to you. You're very right that in the universities and schools, we find that resources and funding are down. But this question that you raised, that Indian knowledge must have some purpose, or what is the purpose of Indian knowledge, is now relegated to the midlife crisis of most corporate chieftains. Yeah. So what we find is that many large corporations have set up foundations to investigate this purpose, and there are a lot of people putting in a lot of uh, resources to try to recover some of this knowledge to study it yeah. outside of the governmental system. Right. OK, well, here, uh, you know, I, I welcome I welcome that. I, uh, I have 
benefited greatly from the philanthropy of, of, of learned and caring men and women. The Murti Classical Library of India, which is funded to the tune of five and a half million dollar endowment from the family of Narayan and Rohan Murti in Bangalore, is an example. I and mean, we will, nine months from now, we will make available to the people of India uh, our first five books, printed, hardback, paperback, and free digital ebooks, thanks to the generosity of this family. And we will, 100 years from now, there will be 500 books of every sort, Kannada, Telugu, Tamil, Sanskrit, Persian, Kashmiri, and so on. Private people can do great good. My one concern how to put this I'm not I, I was about to say my one concern is that they should follow my philosophy now that's not a, <laughs> that's not a very good way to to put this you you see you know my 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 three part vision of things that there is a that, that there is a historical scholarly critical thing there's a, there's a there's a history of interpretation and then the present uses of the past we must find a way to honor all three and institutions that refuse to honor all three are making a mistake i'll stop with that thank you so much <clears throat> If you can take a plate and have a seat here, and those of you who want to have uh, have questions for uh, Professor Pollock, have have a word with him. Thanks a lot. <laughs>